Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Peter Nalen, Professor and Head of the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth campus. I'm your host for our program tonight on rheumatoid arthritis, tendonitis, and bursitis. The success of this program is very dependent on you, the viewer. So please call in your questions tonight or send them in through email at ask at pbsnorth.org. The telephone numbers can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Anna Fernandez, a rheumatologist with Essentia Health, and Dr. Paul Sanford, an internal medicine specialist with Aspirus St. Luke's. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Carter Andreessen from Spicer, Minnesota, Brooke Wilson from Mount Prospect, Illinois, and Wyatt Windhorst from Alexandria, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program, rheumatoid arthritis, tendonitis, and bursitis. And with that, Dr. Fernandez, the first question is, what is bursitis? Well, think of uh, our joints, for example, in your shoulder. You have bones that are close together and they're, they're kept together by ligaments and tendons. And in order for things to move smoothly, we have these fluid-filled sacs um, that allow things to move without friction. But they can get irritated. And so if they get irritated because of overactivity or an injury, they can get inflamed. And then they would be tender, they would be swollen, um, and, and it would be localized pain. So that would be one way that we would be able to identify that the patient has a bursitis. You mentioned the shoulder. What other joints might be involved in bursitis? Bursitis are very common. We have them all over our body, so the shoulder is very uh, a, a common area. The knee, the outer part of the hip also has a big bursa that we tend to um, recognize. Sometimes the feet uh, behind the ankle, so the elbow, there's a big bursa at the elbow. So we really have these little bursa sacs all over our bodies that allow us to have fluid motion uh, and without a whole lot of friction. And uh, thank you. Dr. Sanford, uh, aspirin was first synthesized about more than 100 years ago. And uh, why is it still used? Because it works. Yeah, acetosalicylic acid, that's one of many different salicylates, but you know, in the old days, the Ojibwe people used to use the loam of the bark of the willow, which had a high amount of salicylates as a pain controller. There's still a basic foundation, aspirin and its cousins, in treating arthritic pain. And Dr. Fernandez, in treating some of these conditions that we'll be talking about uh, this evening, um, what is the role of topical medicines and what are some examples? So uh, topical medicines are um, substances that we have them over the counter now. Some of them used to be prescription and now are over the counter, Voltaren or Diclofenac gel. Uh, they do allow um, some minimal uh, um, uh, penetration through the skin, so it's less side effects compared to some of the oral anti-inflammatories that are available, but they can uh, cause a lot of relief. They can be very helpful to some patients, particularly with the small joints of the hands and feet. They can offer a lot of relief. There's several of them out there that have methyl salicylate, diclofenac. There's even some uh, lidocaine roll-on. So there's some things for minor um, pain that can be pretty effective. And, e and even when in people with kidney problems, which has always yeah. been a barrier, or who are on blood thinners, that's always mm -hmm. been a barrier. So this, these are wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanford, what are the features of rheumatoid arthritis in adults? Well, you look for swelling and pain, warmth and redness, rubor, calor, dolor, and tumor. Usually in these joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints, it'll start, but it can extend through all of the finger joints and the feet too, and, and uh, that means we've got to start looking for an inflammatory process. Thank and you. And the pattern of arthritis for rheumatoid arthritis, um, patients notice a lot of stiffness in the morning. It's yep. a lot of swelling in the morning. Uh, they're going to notice that there's some visible swelling of the joints as opposed to, for example, the degenerative arthritis, which may be a lot of pain at the end of the day after overactivity, after overdoing it. And so there's a difference in the pattern, and we want to make sure that people recognize rheumatoid arthritis just because we have so many 
uh, treatment options available now that we didn't have even a couple decades ago. And how might those treatments be helpful if started early? How do you advise patients? It's wonderful. That's a great question. I think our patients who develop an inflammatory arthritis, so swollen, red, very painful, uh, can have a lot of destruction. So for us, we think of swelling as destruction of a joint. And so these are medications that are available as you work together with your doctors. We want to quiet down that inflammation as quickly as possible because that means that we're preventing damage down the line. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sanford, under what conditions or criteria are joint replacements considered for rheumatoid arthritis? Well, pain, disability, inability to do activities of daily living like tying your shoes or, but it's an orthopedic type question, but really it's how much does the pain or deformity limit your ability to do even the most simple tasks? And not just limited to the, to the rheumatoid arthritis. You know, our patients with osteoarthritis and some of the other types of arthritis. And we want to make sure that they are doing things on their own to prevent getting to that level. So we want all conservative measures before. If you are a little bit on the heavier side, losing a little bit of weight can help. Stay active as best as you can. So there's a handful of things that our patients can do to delay the need for a joint replacement. Thank you. And Dr. Fernandez, a viewer from Wisconsin wants to know, is joint injection for bursitis safe and uh, is it worth it? So uh, cortisone injections uh, can be very effective uh, for bursitis and for the joints. Uh, usually it's a steroid and we don't want to abuse it, meaning we don't want people to do repeat injections more than every three to four months. We want them to extend it. And usually it's after you fail conservative measures. So we want to make sure that you're taking advantage of the ice, the topical arthritic rubs, rest, sometimes splinting. Uh, so these are some of the things that can work, but if it's really affecting the walking and, the, and there's a lot of pain, the cortisone injections could be um, very helpful. Thank you. Dr. Sanford, here's a question with a subtle difference. What is tendinosis and how is it different from tendinitis? Well, itis means inflammation, pain. Osis can mean thickening. Um, if you have a really inflamed tendon, just moving a joint will be painful, but not where the bone is meeting bone, but in the tendons that are allowing you to flex and extend. Tendinosis can be any term for anything that's a derangement to the tendons, whether it's trauma or medications. Um, yeah, it's a whole spectrum. Dr. Fernandez, a uh, viewer asks, what causes rheumatoid arthritis? When we get there, we're going to have a lot of solutions for our patients. <laughs> Uh, but there are some genetic uh, predisposition to rheumatoid arthritis, so first degree relatives of someone who has rheumatoid arthritis may be at higher risk. Um, there are some environmental factors because even identical twins do not both get rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there are some things that you can do, for example, if you have a, a, a genetic predisposition because you have a family member who has rheumatoid arthritis, make sure that you're not a smoker. Smoking has been associated with an increased risk of rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. Another one is make sure that you take good care of your teeth because gingivitis and inflammation of the gingiva and infection of the mouth has also been associated with a higher risk of rheumatoid arthritis. But there's a lot of research uh, going on trying to identify what can we do, how can we modify, and how can we recognize people that are at risk much sooner before the clinical findings are evident. Mm. Thank you. Dr. Sanford, regarding uh, these conditions of inflammation like bursitis and tendinitis, what foods or drinks can make them worse or better? Well, you know, just remember what Grandma said. Avoid sugar. Have the diet be primarily darker fruits and vegetables. Eat lean meats and fish. As far as specific foods that cause inflammation, the biggest answer is too much of them. If we end up getting too heavy, I should talk. Um, you know, then we're going to see degeneration in my meniscus cartilage and the other structures of my weight-bearing joints. Okay, and a related question, can turmeric help with tendonitis? 
Some people, I don't know, yeah. what do you think, Dr. But Fernandez? Turmeric is a supplement that people are using to try to uh, get some relief of pain. Uh, remember that most of the supplements are not studied and we don't know how they interact with some of the medications that patients may be taking. We do have a group of patients that do feel that uh, turmeric uh, may help um, buy the spice and cook with the spice. That also could be um, effective. Um, so it's a trial and error, but a lot of, just remember that a lot of these supplements are not um, studied with other medications that people may be taking. Dr. Sanford, what can be done to make Achilles tendonitis better, or what could the patient do to make it better? Well, when people have inflammation of the big tendon of the back of the ankle, the main thing is give it a rest. If you're not having, you know, lots of redness, swelling, or a rupture of the tendon, stay off the leg and just elevate ice. And if it's still bugging you, then, you know, see your orthopedist or rheumatologist or internist. But yeah, any type of stress, trauma can cause trouble with the Achilles. From uh, Hermantown, a viewer asks, when you have arthritis, is neuropathy in your feet a side effect? Dr. Fernandez? So neuropathy usually means that patients are noticing a burning type of sensation, uh, typically in the toes, and it may progress. Um, I don't think of neuropathy as one of the signs of rheumatoid arthritis, unless they have very severe advanced disease and there's also entrapment of nerves. I'm really thinking more diabetes. Yep. I'm thinking more some of the vitamin deficiencies. So it's really important to make sure that patients are aware what kind of symptoms are they noticing. So if it's burning sensation, uh, numbness, pins and needles, uh, that is triggering a completely different differential diagnosis than mm -hmm. just a, a rheumatoid arthritis picture or psoriatic arthritis. Mm -hmm. A different workup and potentially Correct. Mm -hmm. different diagnoses, mm -hmm. including diabetes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Sanford, uh, what is the role of blood tests in the evaluation of arthritis? Well, blood tests are the last thing that we tend to do. The most important thing is talking to the person, finding out the issues of timing, quality, characteristics, et cetera, and then the physical exam. And once you have a suspicion that this person has rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, then you order the appropriate screening study, rheumatoid factor or an antinuclear antibody. But yeah, I think that 90% of our diagnosis isn't in lab tests, it's in talking to the person and examining them. Because there are some patients that may have a blood test that was done because they were not feeling well, and they may have a marker for rheumatoid arthritis, like for example, we have the rheumatoid factor, we have CCP antibodies, but if they don't have red hot swollen joints, they don't have rheumatoid arthritis. So we have to do the labs in the context of the history and the physical exam. Hmm. That makes sense, thank you. Uh, and speaking of physical exam, what are key points of the physical exam for tendonitis? So a lot of it is gonna depend on the location. Um, so if someone has a tendonitis in the shoulder, for example, the biceps tendon, uh, it's gonna be painful with active motion, meaning you are doing and you're reaching, it's very painful. If someone is doing the motion for you, it may not be as painful. Also localized pain at the side of the, uh, the tendon can, can cause a lot, of, uh, a lot of pain. And that's how we try to differentiate between bursitis, tendonitis, and arthritis. And uh, Dr. Sanford, could you uh, elaborate on tendonitis in the thumb or hand? Yeah, well, we have tendons that connect every muscle to every bone. And so if you're busy hitchhiking and you're finding that it's causing discomfort, quit hitchhiking. But also, you know, you look for inflammation. There's something called tenosynovitis, which is involving any of the muscles and ligaments and tendons of the hand. It's, again, a matter of talking to the person, examining them. That's pretty much all you need for a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And some of the maneuvers that you were showing, the resisted, when we put resistance against the tendon, it will cause more pain. And so that's one way that we can tell tendinitis versus abrasitis. Yep. Superspinatus tendon, if you can't do this, you know, then you think about the rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Fernandez, what are some uh, 
imaging tests that you might order um, further in the evaluation of your patients with rheumatoid arthritis? So that's important because we want to make sure that we are not seeing destructive changes or what we call erosions. And so typically the location that we see rheumatoid arthritis the most are small uh, joints of the fingers, so hands and feet. So we may get x-rays of the hands and feet to look for changes. You know, with the medications that we have nowadays, I really do not want to see erosive or destructive changes because then we are too late. We want to make sure that we're doing the x-rays to have us a baseline, maybe see if there's any change in the bone structure around the joint, we call it periarticular osteopenia. But in reality, we're doing it to make sure that we're not missing something else. There's some hints in the x-rays, whether it could be osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis versus other types of arthritis. So it can help us, uh, but it doesn't give you the complete diagnosis. You have to do the whole picture. All right, well, Dr. Sanford, again about bursitis. If a bursitis is injected, what is injected into it? Usually a steroid, a corticosteroid, and uh, it just helps. It acts like a fire extinguisher. It reduces the inflammation, liberates painless range of motion, maybe not forever, but you can get your bursa shot injection, you know, three times a year, and it's safe. Thank you. I'm looking over this question from ESCO. Um, a caller describes hip bursitis, uh, awakening in the middle of the night, uh, feels uh, like a fire, so apparently hot and uncomfortable. Um, what might be going on with that hip bursitis? That's one of the typical uh, things that people notice is that they turn on their sides and it wakes them up because of pain. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure. And so um, if you started an exercise routine and overdid it, if you went up and down the steps or a ladder, if you've been doing extra work trying to get the garden ready before winter and you're overdoing, if you're going up and down a flight of steps, it can irritate the bursa, which is on the outer aspect of the hips. So we want to make sure that people are doing their stretches that they're using ice, that they're using the topical rubs that we've been talking about. And if the physical therapy can be very helpful to make sure that you don't have a discrepancy in the legs, that you have good shoes. Uh, and then the last resort, then we can do a cortisone injection if symptoms are not improving mm -hmm. with conservative measures. Thank you. Dr. Sanford, from a, a viewer in uh, Ashland, uh, what else do you want to know about uh, the sensation of burning on the inside of the knee. Could this be arthritis and, and what else are you wondering about? Well, if they're wondering if it's deep inside of the knee, well, there any type of inflammation of the, the joints, you know, when you talk with people asking morning, evening, with activity, without activity, is there associated swelling or discoloration? And then in your exam, checking the cruciate ligaments, the collateral ligaments, feeling for fluid in the knee called an effusion. Um, you know, then you get some answers. Remember, there's a lot of bursas. That's right. And there's a lot of bursas in the knee, and there's one that is just underneath the knee that can burn a lot. So, yeah. uh, you know, these could be possible sources of pain. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fernandez, what are the connections between infections and arthritis? Mm -hmm. So, for example, people may have a viral illness uh, and they may develop influenza and we do get joint pain. Uh, a lot of the viral diseases can cause uh, joint pain. Uh, some infections like, for example, Lyme disease, if not treated appropriately, can develop a type of arthritis. If someone has a cut or a wound and it gets uh, infected in the blood and it settles in the knee, they can develop the a septic joint. So, so there could be a connection, uh, but most of the time we want to make sure that we're very attentive to address any infection in the joint right away. Oh boy. Otherwise it causes a lot of damage. Yes, and uh, what are some ways you might detect that? So the signs of inflammation that Dr. Sanford commented, uh, it's going to be very warm uh, to the touch, it's going to be visibly red, it's going to be very painful with motion. And the patient may have a fever because now you have a localized area of infection. So there's going to be other symptoms. They may not feel well. An elderly patient may be confused. Um, so, so those are the things. But a fever and a joint that is red and hot uh, is really a warning signal. 
for infection in mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. joint. Thank you. Dr. Sanford, um, what could contribute to an Achilles tendon tear? Well, trauma, the most common thing, if you decide to jump off your garage roof after shoveling it, you could hyper, you know, extend the joint and tear the tendon. Trauma is the most common one. Sometimes antibiotics in the fluoroquinolone class, like ciprofloxacin, can weaken the tendons and increase the risk of a rupture. Boy, a whole host, do you know of any uh, in others? In the past, some people would do cortisone injections for Ooh, the Achilles, and we tend yeah. not to do that anymore mm, because it, yeah. it predisposes them uh, to tear a repetitive motion. Uh, those are the things that we would be um, attentive to. Another a vocabulary word question uh -oh. uh, from Solon Springs. We've mentioned tendinitis. What is a tendinopathy? Just it's the same. Yeah, yeah same thing, yeah. but it depends on pain. Itis, you think pain, like appendicitis, pain. Or tendinopathy, it usually tends to me that the tendon is not happy. So the tendon is having pain. It may not be torn, uh, but it may, uh, it may be irritated because of an overactivity, overuse, a fall, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So we use the term sometimes interchangeably, but the itis component has a warmth and redness uh, associated to it. Dr. Fernandez, could you de describe a bit about juvenile arthritis? So juvenile arthritis means that our kids can get arthritis, uh, not just uh, as we get older, and usually is uh, arthritis that kids get under the age of 16. And so this, we're talking sometimes four or five year olds that can develop joint pain. They will have um, a swollen knee typically, and so it's a kid who would be running around and all of a sudden is not. Uh, all of a sudden wants to be carried and lifted. And so we tend to see a lot in the knees in the little ones, and it has the same presentation of a swollen, tender uh, um, a joint. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sanford, uh, why might ibuprofen be good for arthritis? Well, it's an anti-inflammatory medicine, like aspirin, and there, there are a bunch of different medicines that are similar to ibuprofen or naproxen sodium Aleve um, that are over the counter and they they all help to reduce the inflammatory cascade in a joint tendon bursa but they have to be careful if people are on blood thinners don't use them if you're um, have kidney trouble don't use them so every yeah. case is yeah. one at a time yeah. one thing doesn't fit everyone yeah. If you have a history of stomach ulcers, you don't yeah. use them. Ooh, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, briefly, Dr. Fernandez, uh, can anything be done to prevent bursitis? Uh, so usually it's going to be be careful if you're doing repetitive motion. So if you know that you have a job that you're doing a lot of repetition, that you're alternating so that you're looking at your mechanics, your body mechanics to prevent that. That if you did go and did a very hard workout, that maybe you're icing um, at the end of the day. So it's really more prevention. Um, Thank you. And uh, another uh, viewer from Duluth asks, are there certain foods to avoid in arthritis? Oh boy, well, you know, somebody's gonna tell me to avoid a cheeseburger. I can't do that. <laughs> but you wanna avoid too much. Everything in moderation, nothing in excess. So the, the okay. trend now is that you are cautious with your carbs, that you have uh, no sugar, that you're ca yep. cautious with processed foods, uh, that if you went out and you ate something and the next day you hurt a lot, that you pay attention because your body may not like that. All right. And uh, can there be uh, pain in the, in the shin associated with problems in the knee? Dr. Sanford? Yeah, well, you know, you can. You can get radiation of pain down into the shin, the tibia. You always want to make sure that people don't have something called the hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, big scrabble word, but it can be a pain associated with other more malignant causes. All right. Anything on that, Dr. Fernandez? Um, remember that in that shin area, there is no joint. So those are two long bones that we have there. There's some uh, soft tissue that connects them, so they can be irritated. Again, it's going to be repetitive use or not use. You know, b being sedentary can aggravate some of these things. 
and like uh, Dr. Sanford said, making sure that we're not missing something else, a stress fracture, malignancies. Yes, and uh, imaging might have a role in that workup? Right, just to make sure, yeah. Okay, well, I uh, want to thank our panelists, Dr. Anna Fernandez and Dr. Paul Sanford, and our medical student volunteers, Carter Andreessen, Brooke Wilson, and Wyatt Windhorst. Next, next week, please join Dr. Ray Christensen for a program on diabetes and other endocrine topics, including hyper and hypothyroidism, when his panelists will be Dr. Kanan Kasturi, Dr. Chris Akoidi, and Dr. Jason Wall. Thank you for watching. Good night.